and the commentary that William has to offer, which is always insightful. But before turning this over to him, I'd like to make just a few announcements on behalf of the League. First of all, membership. This year marks the 55th year that the League has been in operation. We are an integral support group of the DSO, and we plan and execute the projects that provide financial support to the orchestra and education. And Sound Bites is one of these activities. So if you're not yet a member, we'd, and we'd like to become one, it's easy to do. The forms are available on the DSO website. You can find us under About Us. And memberships are available at different levels. They start at $25. Every dollar goes to the orchestra and education. So by signing up now, you could be a member for the rest of this year and next year. And then secondly, geraniums. For those of you who participated in our March geranium sale, it was a big success and we thank you. So we look forward to seeing you on Monday to pick up your flowers, please don't forget. And now I'd like to introduce our music director and conductor, um, William Intrilligator, and he will in turn uh, introduce uh, our guest artist. Thank you to Joan and to everybody from the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra League for their support of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra in so many ways. Hosting these luncheons, as Joan said, is just one of the many things that they do. Um, we really appreciate their incredible financial support and their support especially for education. And welcome. It's so wonderful to be with you today. I wish we had better spring weather, yeah. but we have an exciting program that will certainly warm us um, inside and out. Um, before we get to that, uh, you know, we have some special guests. And before we get to that, I want to take a moment to recognize uh, some folks who have really helped make this concert possible. Without the support of our concert sponsors, these kinds of programs of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra would not be possible. We've been very fortunate to have long-standing support uh, from both of our concert co-sponsors today, and they, ha they are here with us. We want to recognize Jim and June Gantz for their wonderful sponsorship. And following on the full of our book. So thank you, thank you so much. And then we also have John Nemers and Stacy Hines representing Dubuque Bank and Trust. Uh, again, longtime sponsors, we really appreciate your support in making these concerts possible. Welcome to John and Stacy. <laughs> and like, before we start focusing on the program itself, I wanted to invite our executive director, Mark Wallard, up to join me. We have a bittersweet announcement, um, and it actually ties in with the recognizing the sponsors because we've been very fortunate these past 17 years, uh, the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra has a, had a remarkably wonderful development director in Gene Tucker. I'm gonna pass it on to, to Mark for this announcement. Great, well, I, uh, we're having trouble with the microphones here, yeah. so I'm just gonna wing it. Yeah. But as William had said, Gene Tucker, our wonderful director of development, uh, for 17 years, about a month ago, was offered an opportunity to join the BBM sisters at Mount Carmel as their director of development. Oh. It is a fantastic opportunity and a perfect fit for Jean uh, uh, as she continues her career. So this is a bittersweet uh, moment for us, but also a genuine thank you. I think all of us in this room have probably been touched uh, by Jean's uh, wisdom and leadership and kindness over the many, many years. So I would just hope that you join me if we can get Jean. I know she doesn't want a lot of attention, and it's not an easy, uh, easy move for any of us. But I just would uh, love you to help. Me. Yeah, Jean has been exceptional. Not only is she so good at what she does, but she loves the music. And she has music in her background and music in her soul. And she's always going to be part of the family. And she, as, as you know, for those of you who have worked with her, She's incredibly organized, but she also has such grace and wonderful people skills too. So we will really genuinely miss you in so many ways. Thank you for everything you've done. Here, here. Yeah. Thank you. And as you know, I get to have the concert weekend off. And we have a wonderful <laughs> guest conductor and wonderful guest soloist. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about why I thought it was important to bring my old dear friend Tarana Sarah Jobin to Dubuque. Um, and that's partially because, as you know, we're exploring women composers all season long and women performers. And I really feel that um, the male dominated field of orchestral conducting and, and opera conducting, you know, is, is kind of a problem. 
and uh, there are fantastic women conductors now, and there should be more of them, and they should have the highest positions available to them. One of the things that makes Tirana's career so special is that she has, as she likes to call it, broken the glass podium at many different orchestras and opera companies. Yes. Yes. And she and I go way back when we were students together at the Pierre Monteau School and Festival in Hancock, Maine for three summers, at least in the 90s. Um, so I just felt like, you know, by being a male conductor in this male-dominated conducting field, it's almost like um, there's this kind of quiet acceptance of the sort of privilege that I might have had in getting this position. So I really feel it's important. Oh, thank you. We have a mic. Yes. I really, yes, thank you so much. I really feel it's important. As you may recall, there was another conductor on our classic series about four or five years ago, the Italian conductor Gianna Fratta. And it was wonderful again to have a woman conductor on the podium for the debut symphony. Um, so we welcome Tirana Sarah Joven, Maestra, and come on up here. We'll start talking about the program together. And we also decided we were going to invite our guest pianist to join us for the entire conversation instead of si sort of saving the soloist for the end. So please join me in welcoming the fantastic pianist, Sarah Davis Buchner. In, in the case of Sarah, I have been wanting to bring her to debut for so many years, and I have to say, your manager is the most persistent but pleasant <laughs> manager who there ever has been. She's like reminding me, like she's asking about my kids and things like that, but we have been trying to get you here for literally, I think it's been 15 years, and you are busy, or we're, you know, dates and things didn't work, and it's been such a pleasure to finally have you here. I just regret that it's not me on the podium this time, but you know, you have a wonderful, wonderful conductor to join you. So welcome. And I don't know if we're gonna have more than one mic. Is this just it? There might be a handheld that was working. Okay, well I'll let you guys share that. You two share this. And well maybe Tarana, let's start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about your background before we get into the actual pieces on the program this weekend? Tell us a little bit about you know, you know, and give them all sorts of dirty details about me in my 20s or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun in conducting school. I, I was in the viola section and William was in the oboe section, but we were both conductors, so we would both sort of, it was kind of like going through boot camp. It was. Like you would play, you know, 60 pieces in six weeks or something and you had to learn how to conduct them on the fly. You had to be ready on like a 24 hours notice to conduct anything in the surprise party. Anyway, it was it was fun and it was you know it was a memorable time. So I'm very grateful for this invitation and um, it's nice to be with all of you. It's nice to be in Iowa. It's my first time in Iowa. Yay. I just came from Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Different and I used to work in Ohio. <laughs> it was just funny how you know where I was in Idaho, you know, people are getting all of those confused. But like, no. Um, so, I don't know, my background, I've done a lot of opera, um, San Francisco Opera was sort of my home company, and it's funny, the whole woman thing, like now it's like fashionable to be a woman conductor, and that's great, and also like I've been doing it for 25 years, and like nobody cared, <laughs> and you know, we just do our thing because we follow what we love, and it's nice that the conversation has changed nationally now, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing to be part of it. It's a little weird for me. It's a little daunting for me, actually, because there's, um, I mean, I'm interested in your uh, perspective on this, too, uh, when we get to it. But the conversation has changed so radically. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I don't want to talk about, actually. I'd like <laughs> to just forget a lot of that stuff and uh, just, like, do what I love. And so, I don't know. So, um, I've done a lot of opera. I was the first... Well, I, you know, because I was in the place and I was ready and I knocked on the door, I was the first woman to conduct at San Francisco Opera on the main stage uh, subscription <coughs> series. So that was really fun. That was in 2004. Nobody could believe that in San Francisco, the most progressive place, you know, probably in the country or something, that it was like 2004 before that happened. But um, yeah, so, and I've always done opera and symphony both. Yeah. 
and you're brilliant. You went to Harvard and you grew up in you know, piano, viola, and all these other things. Um, what drew you to conducting early on? Because I remember, and you didn't even remember this, but I mentioned this to you a few days ago. I was like, I remember when we were really young, you wanted to start this, the Serrano Sarah Joven Orchestra. And you're like, really? I was going to name it after myself? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> early on, you wanted to conduct, like somehow really early on. Tell us about that. I think when I was two, I was conducting along with Arthur Fiedler on the Boston Common. That's what my dad told me. Because um, you grew up in, the, was it the Boston area? I grew up or? in the Boston area. But it was really when I was 15 and I saw Leonard Bernstein at Tanglewood. And what fascinated with me, I was there as a pianist. I was in the high school program as a pianist. But like you were supposed to spend all this time alone in a practice room and like that wasn't fun. And so I wanted to, but you could go to the Boston Symphony Orchestra rehearsals for free and you could, you know, there were all these amazing musicians and you could just listen to them all the time for free. And this was like my version of paradise. Actually, it was, um, it was green and there was music all the time, 24 hours, and you could just listen. So uh, I just remember sitting in the Boston Symphony Orchestra rehearsals and the sound of the orchestra would change depending on how they felt about the person who was on the podium. And that was fascinating to me because there were really famous conductors and there were a lot of guys, you know, there was one guy who wasn't wearing shoes and I thought that was so rude. <laughs> and, um, and I won't name him, but some of the, um, you could tell how they felt, and it was depending on if the conductor was serving the music or serving their ego, basically. And it was like really obvious. If you just sat there for a month and listened and watched all these people go by, um, it was amazing. And so I think that's what, and then, you know, Leonard Bernstein, did, have any of you, did any of you have the privilege of like seeing him conduct in real life or anything? Okay. A few. So a few, but um, I mean, it, it was like, it didn't matter if you wanted to listen deeply to the music. He would just like, his music making would just like reach out to your heart and grab it and like twist it around and like in, you know, in beautiful ways. And it just, it moved me so much. I remember thinking, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that is my. Yeah. That explains it. So you got the bug in your teenage years. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then why didn't you go to a conservatory? Because I'm kind of thinking about my path. You know, we had similar kind of Ivy League kind of path instead of the conservatory path. Like, if you were so set early on, how come you didn't go to New England Conservatory, Juilliard, Curtis, or someplace like that? I ended up at Harvard. I ended up walking up the street to a piano teacher who was on the <coughs> faculty at New England Conservatory, and I studied piano with her, Patricia Zander. Um, yeah, of course. Some of you might be familiar with Benjamin Zander. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to educate my whole brain, and I didn't want to be, I'm sorry for how this is going to come out, but I didn't want to be like in an ant hill. <laughs> like, I can't stand being the same as everybody else when everybody else is working really hard and they're all doing the same thing. I can't stand that. Right. So, um, I didn't want to be in a conservatory. <laughs> That's great. So, I did my own thing. I mean, I started um, conducting at Harvard, and uh, then I went to the Piermont School, and then a lot of my education was in the Opera House. So. <coughs> Wonderful. Enough about me. Can, can we talk about the music? <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Sarah. Okay, let's talk about uh, Sarah. Yeah. Well, well, all right. So let, let's start with my career as a conductor, which is <laughs> an extremely short one, I should say. Have you ever conducted from the piano? No. No. Uh, no. Uh, I. I when I was young, I, I was one of those ants in the anthill. I, I attended the Juilliard yeah, School, I mean, and, and, and it was it was as you say, it was like an anthill. I mean, fire ants, and, and, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very very aggressive and, and competitive kind of place, you know. But I did I did quite well there, and and at a certain point, after getting a bachelor's and a master's, and I, I was in their doctoral program, I, I just flipped out one day and I said, I've had enough of Juilliard, and I just left the place, and I was all. In my 20s and I was playing concerts and later in my 20s I, I really wanted to study it was a very famous pianist named Byron Janis who was teaching at the Manhattan School and I thought you know I'm gonna go back to school and finish a doctor I wanted to study with that man and so when I enrolled in this Manhattan School and I was 28 or so at the time I thought you know I'm gonna do all those things that I never gave myself permission to do at Juilliard because I was so young I thought I'm just a pianist you know 
So I studied composition and conducting. Yeah. These were the two things that I had neglected. You know, and I thought, I really want to see how I do with these things. And I thought, well, I'll be a terrible composer. I have nothing to say, but I'll see what it's like. And conducting, well, anybody can conduct. I mean, <laughs> put on the LP, you know. I mean, you know, this, this Mendelssohn's Italian goes like this. We just did that. <laughs> it's so funny. I knew of all the pieces. <laughs> and then Beethoven's fifth, that's a snap. Da -da 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 <laughs> you know, it's simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> we had such a wonderful teacher. His name was David Gilbert. He was an assistant conductor. Oh, yeah. Phil, very, very sweet man. And, and I was absolutely by far the worst student in the class. I, I was terrible. I had no skill. And it, it was educational in a way, you know, because I I'd started piano when I was three, and I had a great deal of natural talent at the piano. But to study some aspect of music for which I had absolutely not one shred of of talent, you know, in my score, I remember in the final exam, we had to conduct a string quartet with a singer, and I had like make cutoff here with a circle, you know. I remember doing the one and the two, and the thing. oh, oh, I forgot the cutoff. <laughs> Just like you know, conduct by numbers. You know? <laughs> you know, it was good for it. It was like I really learned, you know, that's that's that's, that's, that's yeah. like very very hard. With it. You know, the composition that I thought would be terrible, I was like, oh, I started this. I could write anything. I could write. Really? Yeah, do I you still yeah. compose at all? I do compose from time to time. There's only one problem with my composition. I wrote a great piano sonata. Sounds just like Prokofiev. I wrote a great <laughs> concerto. <laughs> sounds just like Rachmaninoff. I wrote. You know, I can write music. It sounds like everybody else. So I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind, of, kind of a long story. Well, maybe that experience solidified that you were meant to be a pianist. Is that well, right? Or you knew that already? This I knew actually, and this is this is. This is, I would say, of all the concerts that I've played this last season, this is one that I've looked forward to probably the most, simply because we are in this, the great state of, of Iowa, and I have some very nice stories about Iowa. But it all goes back to the very first thing my first piano teacher asked me at the age of three. She was a Hungarian immigrant, she came to our house, and she was teaching my older brother piano lessons, and my mother knew and my brother didn't have talent, but I did. And she begged, <laughs> begged the teacher to teach me. And she said, it's too young, too young, too young. And said, finally, you know, my mother, who was kind of an aggressive tiger mom type, you know, wouldn't relent. And the teacher picked me up. She told me many years later by my little hands, put me in her lap. And she said, now, and I do remember the way she talked. She had this wonderful uh, toothy, toothy grin, Budapest accent. She said, what is it you want to be when you're growing up? <laughs> And I actually said to her, I want to be a piano player and a pig farmer. <laughs> I just, I don't know, I always liked those animals very, very much. And then later I found that I was born in the Chinese year of the pig. And there's, you know, pigs in, in Asian cultures are always uh, harbingers of, uh, of good luck. And, uh, if uh, in Korea, if you have a dream about a pig, it means you're going to come into money, you know, very, 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 very soon. So you were meant to be so in Iowa. I was meant to be yes. in Iowa, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And I was telling at the table here, uh, probably 20 years ago, the first time I visited this state, I gave a recital at uh, Waldorf College in Forest City. And I got off a bus. I, this is, I always tell people this because you think to be a classical musician is to lead a glamorous life. <laughs> <laughs> to be a classical pianist means taking Greyhound from Pittsburgh, Kansas to Forest City, Iowa. And there, a the, the nice uh, middle-aged woman met me at the station. We got into her station wagon, and uh, she drove me to the Super 8 Motel, where I was staying. Real high and, quality. Yes, exactly. And she said, now, is there anything you'd like to do specially here while you are with us in Forest City, Iowa? And I said, well, I was born in the Chinese year of the pig, and I've always liked pigs, and I know that Iowa is the land of pigs and corn, and I want very much to see a pig farm. <laughs> and I think this was my introduction to Iowa psychology, because she didn't answer me for a full five minutes. She just <laughs> wrote it on. Didn't, didn't crack a smile, and finally she spoke, she said, now, my brother is a pig farmer, and I could take you there, but none of our visiting artists ever asked to do that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Did you see I the did. pig farm? Yes, I oh, went to the great. pig farm, and I, uh, I washed those clothes three times and then threw them out. <laughs> Thank you.
and I couldn't go near anybody for a number of days. <laughs> but I had a, a really a, a good intro into the, fa the farm life. And when I get older, who knows? I mean, maybe he's a composer. No, no, I'd rather, I'd rather be a pig farmer. Actually, someone mentioned, uh, someone mentioned uh, someone they, you know has a pet pig. So I, yeah, I, I, there we go. I have to go. And, they're, yes. they're very adorable creatures, and they taste wonderful, as you know. <laughs> 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 so, well, right. let's turn the attention to the program. Yeah. We have... Let's <laughs> take it away for a while. Yeah. So we have these Beethoven bookends, right? right. Uh, the piano concerto will be the entire second half, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Well, we're going to open with uh, one of the like, really intense overtures um, that Beethoven wrote that one could say is equally about the sort of historic figure of Coriolan, but also uh, maybe about Beethoven himself. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this, Tara. Yeah, there's a lot of struggle happening in this opening uh, overture. It's based on, um, uh, it's a Shakespeare, you can take it, Collins, anyway, this drama. He's a Roman patrician. He's uh, defending the ruling class, defending the upper class, and then he kind of figures out that that's the wrong thing to do <laughs> in that time, and his wife and his mother convince him that that's not actually what he should be doing. It's a, you know, it's a time of democratization. Um, and so whatever's happening there, you know, I sort of think of it as the death of the patriarchy. Um, <laughs> that's just what happens in my own head. Um, it, whatever, there's a battle going on in Beethoven's psyche. It's also the time when he first discovered, he started going deaf. So, and the overture is written uh, just two years before the piano concerto, although the musical languages are really different. It's, it's interesting. But, um, so there's a lot of struggle, sort of storm und drang happening in this overture. There's a very, you know, there's a lot of her heroism happening in Beethoven's music at this time, his internal struggle. And then there's the beauty side. There's like really, really beautiful um, sort of beauty and love theme. And these go, they sort of battle back and forth. And at the end, uh, he decides that he must die uh, he, he had sworn an oath of you know, loyalty until death to protect this upper class, and he realizes that's not the thing to do, and so he drinks the potion and he dies. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to think of it. There are, um, and yeah. there was so much going on politically when Beethoven wrote this, too, with Napoleon and the, you know, kind of the rise of democracy, the fall of the aristocracy around him. There was that, too. And then there's just, like you were saying, his personal struggles with his deafness. There's this musical depiction of an iron will, of like incredible obstinacy and determination. And uh, it happens at several points in the piece, and it starts that way. It's just the intensity of the entire orchestra playing one note for holding it for a very long time, just dum, and then bam. You know, there's like this, it's like explosive, but that comes back, boom, that one note. It's like Beethoven's iron will. It's like him trying to defy, you know, his fate of being deaf or all the other issues that he was dealing with. And I feel like he must have really related to the character of Coriolan. Um, he wants to control stuff that he can't control. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. And. Then you have the second theme, like you said, it has so much beauty in it. But over the course of the overture, that second theme kind of gradually transitions into something kind of like a nightmare. Uh, it sort of develops, right, into a way that it almost like becomes distorted and dark. It starts out this beautiful theme that may represent his wife or his mother pleading with him to change his mind and give in. But then it sort of it sort of evolves and it, it sort of becomes dark in its own weird way. I don't know if, how you felt about that. It's funny, a newspaper reporter, I don't know, a week or two ago, asked me for an overarching theme for the whole uh, concert, and I didn't have an answer at that time, but I, it got me thinking, and for me, my own take on this program is exactly what I just said, it's that, it's that old patriarchy that just has to die, like, I'm, I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's there is a there is a battle in there but finally I mean I think of where we are in 2022 
and you know the events of the last two years and how much has um, transformed in American society and uh, you know it, and as it relates to the next piece like um, what is our legacy how do we transform uh, maybe what we were born into how, how has the conversation changed um, so that that overture leads into the next piece um, which is by Mary Watkins which is she's an American composer from Colorado she's a fantastic composer you may not have heard of her before um, she's written like three operas I would you know I would recommend looking her up um, if anything I just thought I would play a little bit of her piece on the piano so please excuse my voice there's something in opera called voce di coach which means that I'm not a singer. <laughs> but like voice of the coach, which is like, ah, you know. <laughs> um, but I just want to sing you a little bit of her opening melody because when I started, when I found this piece and started learning it at the piano, I just couldn't stop singing it because mm, yeah. it's so gorgeous. So you don't have to be afraid of like contemporary music on this program. Oh no, <laughs> this is beautiful, soulful piece. Also, because I don't have enough hands to play the melody. <laughs> It's a beautiful, I think it's a prayer actually. Um, it's called Soul of Remembrance. And it's, um, she, she's actually writing, she wrote a suite of pieces depicting the African American experience in the United States. And it's remembering all of the people who have died and all of the suffering and the, the, this amazing pianist who died yesterday or the day before so as a legacy of, of this. So it's, it's a it's a really beautiful piece. Um, and that and left hand was actually the harp. This is so the harp I mean, the <laughs> harp has this beautiful, gorgeous kind of just continual arpeggios of chords that keep it moving forward. And that soulful sound of all like violins and violas all singing this beautiful melody that ends up soaring higher and higher and higher. It's like it's going to heaven. So William liked this piece so much that he programmed it with his other orchestra. Yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for telling me about it. <laughs> um, but yeah. So it's, it's a beautiful piece. And then we go to the Louise Ferenc yes. Symphony. And Louise Ferenc was being born while the overture was being written, basically. Uh, <laughs> to the Beethoven, just, yeah. Yeah, while the Beethoven overture was being written, to, just to put it in the time frame. She's French. Um, she certainly admired Beethoven. I think there are a few references to him in her music. That there's so many subito dynamics in the Beethoven. His, he's so like, uh, he's so disciplined and kind of like crazy in the way that he's uh, uh, 
it's like so forceful all of a sudden and then so quiet and beautiful all of a sudden and then so forceful. Um, I basic. called him bipolar the other day in rehearsal and I like, didn't quite mean to do that, but just, you know, just, uh, so she is, she also refers to some of that in her musical writing. It's very classical. It's going to sound like a beautiful classical symphony to you. Again, it's probably a symphony that you've never heard, but you don't need to be afraid of it. It's, um, it's beautiful music. It has a really nice slow moment. It has a fast scherzo that's light and fun. Um, and and that has a middle section that, if you listen to it the right way, sounds like Happy Birthday, the Happy Birthday song. <laughs> now I've ruined it for you, have I? <laughs> <laughs> no, in the, not gone there. in the woodwinds, in the scherzo movement, there's like it sounds a lot like the Happy Birthday song. But before the Happy Birthday, before what were their names, Patty and Mildred oh, wow. Hill, who wrote, wrote it in the 19, yeah. So this was long before that. I just did an opera that actually quoted Happy Birthday. Wow, that's so, an opera. So yeah. that I did not catch that in the symphony yet, but <laughs> but it's a it's a beautiful trio, and she was very accomplished in her time. A French woman, um, you know, a lot of women have been very accomplished, and then they get erased, you know, from history. So like we're tired of that, right? <laughs> so uh, it's nice that some of this, we're sort of rediscovering some of these gems, and we're honoring some of these women who were successful in their time, and then you know, they get written out of history. So let's not do that anymore. Um, it's a beautiful symphony. It's not easy for the orchestra. No. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> um, very exposed. Yeah. And she, she uses just a classical size orchestra, like Mozart size. I mean, it doesn't even have trumpets. What an incredible timpani part, though. Like, she also, I think, borrowed that from Beethoven, being able to use the timpani drums as for a real musical expressive expression. Um, but like, there's such a focus on the woodwinds. Um, and there is a sort of a French tradition of harmony, you know, the kind of woodwinds focus on that. Um, maybe even going back to people like Gounod and the Petite Symphony and stuff like that. But one thing that there was absolutely no tradition of in France was symphonic writing like this, nothing. So like, this kind of came out of nowhere, right? I mean, so when you think of um, the 1800s and French symphonies, you think of Symphonie Fantastique by Berlioz, right? Which was written maybe 20 years before this piece. But Symphony Fantastique is an anomaly. It's, you know, the ravings of a madman, basically, in a wonderful <laughs> way. We love it. It's a, it's a wild fantasy. So what she was doing was saying that, you no, know, the, the German tradition of Beethoven, Schumann, Mendelssohn has a place here. And there was nobody else doing that in France. Nobody. I mean, I was reading an article that said part of the problem was that there wasn't an opportunity for performances like that in France. There weren't orchestras giving concerts regularly, like there were in almost every big city in Germany. There was the opera house. And so that just naturally meant that composers in that time, in the 1800s, would write operas or perhaps even ballets to go with the operas. But there wasn't this French symphony tradition. And this is her third symphony, friends. So this, she's written a lot of wonderful gems. And, and also, let's not forget, she was a fantastic pianist, the first woman on the faculty at the Paris Conservatoire, I think. Oh. So, um, yeah, so, and she was there for a long time and taught many fantastic students. Um, so she was an important pedagogue and an important figure in, in France. But like you said, how come nobody knows her name? How come, if it wasn't, well, that's right, before Nadia Boulanger was also then became an esteemed pedagogue um, in France. But um, yeah, there's, she was sort of this wonderful aberration, and it's too bad that there weren't other symphonists who followed her example in France. But I think part of the reason was that because, like you said, like after these pieces were written, maybe played once, they were forgotten. And if it had been maybe a male composer, it probably would maybe have been a little different. Sorry, no. sorry, I just yeah, stole no, that. Fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted that you know so much. I mean. Just because I'm female doesn't mean that I know all the history of all the <laughs> So I appreciate the. You know, We're tag teaming on this one. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. So let's talk about Beethoven. Yes. Who? 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 Beethoven who? <laughs> well, uh, uh, we've heard we've heard a bit about uh, Ludwig already. Uh, I think any musician. And certainly, all pianists have to to cope with this towering figure, who, in his life, in his work, you know, encapsulates uh, not only you know great musicianship and great composition, but also 
he, he stands apart because of his social stance as, as, as a kind of a revolutionary thinker. And you think of, uh, I, I used to sometimes compare and contrast the careers of Mozart and Beethoven, who came a little bit later, and how Mozart struggled his whole life in kind of servitude to, to various uh, royal, uh, royal employers, <coughs> whereas Beethoven established a real liberation, you know, really announced in his person and through his music that the artist is an esteemed member of society and, and, and uh, they should create and be honored for the creation and so forth. So there's this kind of defiance and, and, and uh, proud voice in, in, in almost all of Beethoven's compositions. And of course, as you mentioned in the overture, I think this is, this is his last uh, of five piano concertos and probably no more so than in this, this uh, piece, which, uh, yes, I'll play one, one, mm -hmm. one, one little snippet of the piece, which is the very opening. And I have a feeling if you've been going to symphonic concerts, you know, you don't need to hear me do that, but you know that he does something very, very rude. You know, I mean, I, I mean you know, imagine, right, you know, if you, if you invited somebody over to your house and they walk in the door and they don't introduce themselves, they don't even take off their muddy galoshes. It's sort of like you open the door and say hello, and the response is, concerto is supposed to be properly set up but by a three to four minute uh, orchestra tutti and then the, the, the soloist comes in you know with great fanfare as you know sort of the star of the show but Beethoven is there to say you know no 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 I'm going to turn things upside down this is the way a concerto should go you know so you know they'll let them do their thing in the background but look at me look at me look at me <laughs> um, but so that's secondly, this was the one piano concerto he didn't premiere because he, with his deafness and his, he wasn't able to didn't do feel the first that he performance. Was able to, yeah. to, to play it. Well, of course, this this feeds into the whole. I mean, there are so many aspects to, to Beethoven's life that make it an incredibly romantic life and a very very appealing life story, including, of course, the deafness, which which was uh, like the ironic curse of all time to someone who was so forward looking in their in, the, in their thinking about music. And you have to wonder how much of his later music really became incredibly experimental and revolutionary simply because he had no opportunity to literally hear it in an acoustic space. It was just in his in his own mind. He was hearing these these fantastic noises. So uh, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's an amazing, wonderful piece. Uh, the pianist gets to play a lot of arpeggios and octaves and show <laughs> off a lot, you know. But the slow moment is is incredibly beautiful. Yeah, it you is. Know, it's, it's a very very lovely thing, and it's and it's quite thrilling. I learned this piece of more than more than 30 years ago, maybe almost 40 now. Uh, I used to play it in the finals of various piano competitions. It always struck me as a winner's piece. Like you should walk on stage with a sash, you know, and a tiara or something. <laughs> <laughs> and now Miss Iowa will play <laughs> something like that. It's great, great exuberant fun. Uh, fun to play. But as with all of Beethoven's music, it's it's for us to enjoy here, but in his own mind, he's thinking about the music of the future. He was, of course, profoundly affecting every composer who would come after him. And if you look at the piano concertos of Franz Liszt that would come just a few years after that, it's the whole tradition of a concerto is now turned upside down. Now it's really you know, a vehicle for showing off. So Beethoven is already anticipating things like Rachmaninoff in his, in his writing, which is quite wonderful. And we had a wonderful rehearsal last night. Mm -hmm. Had a great deal of fun with it, and uh, yeah, and the piano sounds nice and loud, so I can drown <laughs> you out. It's great. great. <laughs> I love doing that. I love that. You know, so, so don't worry. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and I'm practicing my bow as well. It's, it's <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tarana, I was impressed the other day you were saying, well, the, the Beethoven concerto, I won't call it the Emperor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Let's funny. talk about that for a little bit. It well, has this nickname, the Emperor, which Beethoven, Beethoven did not give it. Yeah. This thing doesn't work anymore. No, no, it's it's barely on you. Beethoven, but Beethoven didn't call it the Emperor concerto, yeah. and he didn't want to call it the Emperor concerto. And it has to do with that whole like democratization thing and Napoleon yeah. you know, naming himself what the Emperor, the Emperor. kind of. 
Um, and I, but one thing about Beethoven that I think is amazing as you're talking about Mozart and Beethoven and their differences is that, yeah, Mozart always entered through the back door. He was the servant. He would eat with the servants. He, you know, he was like servant, servant. And Beethoven was like, no, I'm having none of that. I'm a genius. <laughs> and you're going to like recognize me as a genius. And I'm going to give myself an honorary von, Ludwig von Beethoven, which makes himself like royalty, which he wasn't. Oh. But he put that there to be like, yeah, I'm amazing. And you're going to recognize me. And you're going to like treat me like I'm an amazing. And he changed that whole thing for composers. And then we then we start this whole culture of recognizing the genius of composers, like from him on. I mean, we recognize Mozart now, yeah. but it's just interesting how he like stepped into his like. <laughs> yeah, and he wouldn't yeah. tow to the aristocracy. He was very close friends with many of them, and they, many of them supported him, giving him sort of an annual kind of salaries just to keep him in Vienna for one thing, because he was being lured to other cities. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's that wonderful famous story when he was at dinner, I think at Prince Lichnowsky's palace. Um, and he was close with the prince, but still, one of the things that he didn't like was to have to play for his supper kind of thing. Oh, yeah. So they would invite him over to a dinner, fancy dinner at the palace, and they would ask him to play. And he's like, no, I'm not playing. So I want to eat and I want to be part of this company. I'm not your servant and I'm not going to play. And so the prince kept pushing, you know, please, would you play, would you play? And he finally, you know, stormed out saying, there have been and there will be thousands of princes. There's only one Beethoven. And he left the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite something, right? So yeah, we actually maybe have aptly titled this concert, thanks to our director of marketing, to resonate and revolutionize. It's really exactly what you were talking about. I mean, he was revolutionary. We have these revolutionary women composers. We have the idea of Coriolan and the, like the society around him changing and him not being able to cope. And yeah, so I love that you thought that overall theme is maybe revolution here. That's kind of interesting. So I mean, tell us about how that fits in with the concerto, how you see it maybe. I mean, you have that E flat key signature. It's the it's the same key signature as well, the his heroic Eroica symphony. There's a lot in the concerto that's just it's just not standard. It's just not like two people going back and forth. There's a lot of like sharing. Like at the end of that first moment, the first moment goes on for 20 minutes. I mean, the first moment is like a symphony it is. into unto itself. But then at the end, when we have the theme, we have it for two bars. You have it for two bars. We share the theme. I mean, he does. He doesn't do the normal like. Uh, you know, recapitulation, it's just, yeah, no. it's not the normal thing. No, no, no. well, I mean, he's, he, he, revolutionary is, of course, the, the, the right word to use because, uh, you know, if you listen to this piece, to the Emperor Concerto, in the, in the quiet of your own home, as opposed to the concert hall, you might be forgiven for thinking, oh, yes, I'm listening to a Beethoven symphony. So much of it mm -hmm. is very symphonic, and it's very much as if the piano is one of the instruments in the orchestra. So he's already looking forward to, you know, how can I change this for it? There was nothing that Beethoven got his hands on that he didn't think, what can I do to this to adapt it and change it and make it more interesting or something like that. So, yeah, the form is toyed around with, the modulations are pretty interesting, um, the relationships, the key relationships oh, of yeah. the, the second, second movement to the last movement is, it, it, you know, this is the sort of thing, to our ears, it's nothing. We're so used to, to pop tunes that do this all the time, but if I play a key in, in, in the key of B major, and play a, what we call an inversion of that, then I change a couple of keys using this note, which is, I don't know how many of you were forced to take piano lessons as I was as a child, becoming aware that D sharp is the same as E flat, and that choreal joke, you better C sharp or you'll, or you'll B flat. <laughs> D sharp is the same as E flat. So we learned this in, this is what they teach you in Juilliard, by the way. You're getting, <laughs> you're getting this for free. <laughs> Juilliard is 65,000 bucks a year, let me tell you. So I'm collecting out of a cup. You know? <laughs> anyway, so Beethoven has been toying around E flat major. And then the slow movement comes and it's in this key. Now, we don't even think twice about it, but boy, let me tell you, and the audiences yeah. of Vienna and Salzburg and Mannheim and Munich people were going, oh my god, you can't do that! No, no! Violation, violation. So, it, yeah. in a way, 
I mean, I like to make a joke out of that, but, but as a musician, when I'm playing that piece, I have to keep that uppermost in my mind at all times, because in a sense, you know, part of our, I, I think of our job, but certainly a large part of our job is to recreate these masterpieces and bring them fresh to you so that you have the experience of, oh, gee, what was that like to hear that thing for the first time? So, uh, you know, this also keeps our interpretation, I think, very, very fresh, you know. Yeah. When you play something a lot, it's easy that you get kind of you know, used to it, you know. What are you doing tonight? Ah, the Browns be flat with a New York <laughs> Phil again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> if you ever catch yourself saying that, you should be, you should be, you know. <laughs> Pill or taken to the big farm, there you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one is always aware of the experimentation in that music, yeah. and it has to have a certain kind of pizzazz and energy level that makes people aware, wow, yeah, that's, yeah, that's really something. You know, it's really funny in music how we often struggle to do that, and yet almost every city in America has very fine uh, art museum. And I understand this one here with all these grand wood paintings. Yeah. You know, and I, I never, it never feels visually somehow we go into an art museum and we're just dazzled. It's like, wow, look at that, look at that. It could be hundreds, even thousands of years old, but it, but it holds our attention. But music, just because it's so much more elusive, and how do you capture it in the air and so forth? We, we really have to work, I think, to make that connection quite That's vibrant. True, yeah. So people don't just say, oh yeah, ah, Mozart, I heard it. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> well, this is such you know. a great concerto. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, as you said, it's like a symphonic concerto, so this is such a great way to end the program. I have to say that Emperor Concerto is such a favorite for many, even if you haven't, even if you're not aware that you've heard it before, you might recognize like when we sort of pop the cork on the last movement, mm -hmm. which is just joyful, uh, you're going to know what it is. Shh, don't get up and say, oh, I heard that already. <laughs> <laughs> my cousin who lives in Virginia was like, you're doing the Emperor Concerto. I want to come. I can't believe it. Are they live streaming it? So um, I think you will enjoy yeah. very much the end. <coughs> well, and then the second moment is just one of his most sublime things that he ever wrote. And, and to get that magical sense of that strange harmony of the key modulation from the first to the second movement, you can't wait too long before, after the E flat chords of the first movement to play that B major and the strings in the second movement. But yet you f just finished, like you were saying, Toronto, this 20 minute long first movement, everybody kind of needs to catch their breath. Huh. But if you wait too long, then you don't hear that jarring and magical kind of sounding like we're in a new world. So it's one of those things too. Um, the transition into the third movement is special. Do you want to maybe play a little bit of that? Um, from the way the, the well, B yeah. changes to a B flat? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, it a cute little thing. thing. <laughs> the same old trick again. I mean, nobody has upset me more with this kind of technique than Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. You do it the other way, but uh, Beethoven does it going downwards. And that's uh, something the orchestra goes to. Huh? You can't do that. You don't like it. And the piano sort of says, so yeah, we gotta play this. <laughs> This kind of barn dance, and, and then the <laughs> 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 I, I asked, I asked wow. last night if we were going to distribute the, the the tankers, you know, so everybody <laughs> shines. Yeah. 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 By the way, I mean, I, I wasn't kidding about Frankie Valley. I mean, we all know that. That's the oldest rock trick in the in the book, right? Is, is the half step <laughs> move? <laughs> the half step yeah. move, which you know, you get used to. late 1950s listening to that in the back of somebody's 57 Chevy weren't paying attention to that part of the song. <laughs> 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 yeah, I didn't get the subtlety of all of Frankie Valley is still going going strong, by the way. Oh, and one of the things that I get to cope with as a, as a teacher, I'm a professor at Temple University, is I think it's fantastic when I, I like a, I had a 19-year-old 
uh, Korean pianist who was studying with me. And I came into the, the lesson once, and she had her laptop on, and she was listening to doo-wop hits and, and, uh, and disco music, you know? And I said, what are you listening to that garbage for? And she said, no, this is great, Dr. B. This is the best. Frankie Valli is better than Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> So this stuff that we used to take for granted is now classics. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Fairy oh. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be well. here all week. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to get to a point where you could ask some questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this might seem like the right moment. I don't know. Um, but, you know, Toronto was saying, you know, I'm kind of curious where they are, so let's make yeah. sure we leave time for questions at the end. So, we are at that time, and I'm sorry to spur it on you, sort of spring it on you, um, but we, I'm sure you might have some questions. It's your opportunity. You can ask anything you want. Yeah. What is a conductor really doing up there? <laughs> is a conductor really necessary? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> Sometimes no. <laughs> Sometimes the orchestra can play by themselves and they can Please listen to stop. each other. I want my job. More. <laughs> but not all the time. Sometimes the, time. the conductor gets up there and actually makes it better because they u because there's a unifying idea. It, watching George Cleave. So George Cleave also studied at our conducting school, Pierre Monteux, kind of this lineage. Watching George Cleave, who was a great Mozart conductor. And sometimes he would just stop conducting. Yeah. Like in concerts, like in rehearsals and in concerts, because he just wanted people to listen to each other mm -hmm. and make music together. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. So from a very young age, you obviously could hear music so much better than, I, than any of us in here, and no offense to anybody here, but to be able to hear that passion, that difference, do you sometimes feel your feelings or how you're feeling? come through obviously you're trying to get your feelings through but like if you're in a different mood than you're, what you're prepared for do you sometimes hear that come from yourself like from your orchestra or are there feelings for you I should say it's interesting I uh, for me the journey on the podium is like I, I'm just gonna say that it's like a spiritual journey like the orchestra reflects back to you in the moment where you are um, in in sound and it's kind of amazing it's it's uh, rather humbling <laughs> um, but yes yeah, sometimes it feels like one can express things better through music mm -hmm. than with words for sure um, like sometimes I just want to sit down at the piano and sing that song and like there's nothing that I can say uh, yeah do you want to answer that yeah, I mean, I mean, the, sometimes our greatest experiences as conductors is when we kind of lose ourselves in the performance, yeah. and you you have identified so much with the music and the emotions in it, and that then the piece ends and the applause are coming, kind of jarring. Uh, we appreciate the applause, don't get us wrong, but um, but the it's almost like back to reality of su suddenly, and it's a little bit like oh and now you're back to yourself or something but it, it's it's very much like in a way like being a great actor too um to yeah. really respond to what you're listening to and really give yourself over to that role that you're in and that the you know the story and the passions that are happening there in the moment but I also say, like, people sometimes, in, especially in a symphony concert, like, it, sometimes I like being in an opera pit because nobody looks at me except the performers. Um, sometimes when there's a conductor on stage, people in the audience might focus on, like, what the conductor is doing. But um, the conductor's mind and the pianist's mind or whoever, our mind is focused on, like, what the music means and then just trying to draw that out from everybody. Uh, so like, we don't know what we do half the time. It's yeah. just to like make it happen, <laughs> like stir the soup. You know? So both Tarana and I studied at the same school in Maine for several summers, and yeah. with the most intense teacher you could possibly Hungarian. imagine, who's yeah. Hungarian, Romanian, and like, uh, like extremely like irascible. Yes, yeah. yes. And one of the things that he was continually telling me, as I'm sure you remember, was no cinema, no cinema. 
he wanted to make sure I was not conducting for the audience, I was conducting for the musicians, and I was there to serve a purpose. I wasn't just supposed to show how I feel about the music. No cinema, he was his way of saying that. Remember that? Yeah. He was harsh. Yeah, Frank. Was really harsh. Yeah. Well, recently on, on PBS was a documentary on Aaron Jansen's, the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony. And oh, you mean Marin Alsop? Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. oh, sorry, Marin Alsop. And she also was inspired, she started her career watching yeah. Leonard Bernstein and yeah. Young People's Concert. Yeah. And, uh, and also said she was a mentor to a lot of other women yes. conductors. So do you have any comments on her, Vera? Um, I wrote my Harvard thesis on her. And, <laughs> <laughs> and four other women. At that time, I wasn't interested in opera yet. Um, but I wrote my thesis on the five most successful female American conductors at the time. And she was one of them. She was just starting out. She just like, she had to make her own orchestra because like other people weren't taking her seriously yet. And um, yeah, so uh, she's done great things. She's being a really wonderful spokesperson. Um, and, I, and I do think that Leonard Bernstein inspired an entire generation of American conductors. I mean, him and Yo-Yo Ma are probably some of our best exports, you know, <laughs> in the history of American music. So um, yeah, he, he mentored her early on and gave her a spotlight. And it was so important when Marin Alsop became the music director of the Baltimore Symphony. It was the first major orchestra that had a woman music director in our country. That's not as unusual, I think, in Europe. But then um, what I also especially liked was that about less than a year ago now, um, there was another major orchestra that appointed a woman music director. So it wasn't seen as an aberration with Marin Alsop oh. when the Atlanta Symphony um, hired uh, Natalie Stutzmann. The, the, oh. Is that her? Yeah. yeah. So, so now we have two American, not American, but women conductors of major orchestras in America. Yeah. So it's starting to happen. It's starting to happen. And you, you were telling me that when you were in California, you did some work with the Women's Philharmonic. Is that different than the Cabrillo Festival that Marin Alsop did? Yeah, that's totally different. Yeah, two totally different. Yeah. Uh, I was in Denver when Marin Alsop was oh. leader. Now, what makes the difference in a major uh, orchestra? It's is, just considered. I thought she was pretty major. Yes, <laughs> she was the music director of the Colorado Symphony when you were in Denver. Yes, um, it's just a matter of like, and there are great orchestras all over the country, right? It's just a matter that there's a certain orchestra size that's considered like they have a full-time musicians on a full year salary, mm -hmm. and it's a it that's and, and, and there's just you know originally there were the big five. Yeah. which were like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Chicago. But now there are other great orchestras in this country, LA, like and San Francisco. LA, San Francisco, yeah. Dallas, Houston, Minnesota. Yeah. These are all, and then you would include Atlanta and Baltimore in that list of the major orchestras right now. So they're just orchestras that maybe, in our industry they use a sort of monetary kind of, a budget size to, mm -hmm. to and they may have a budget over a hundred million a year each organization. She wrote a wonderful Too Hot to Handle at oh, Christmas yeah, right. Ten. Yeah. Mary Nelson. Have you heard it? It's a variation on the handle Messiah. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. I remember that. Oh uh, yeah. great. Yeah, I have uh -huh. that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Ruth. I remember William when you were auditioning to become our conductor, there was a woman who two. auditioned. There were two. Right. Yes. Remember. Two of the five Conductors of finalists were women. Yes. You were the best. Oh, <laughs> thank you. No, I carried that guilt with me these 22 years. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were very progressive as uh, as a community here in Dubuque. That when we had the music director search back in 1998, 1999, that there were two women among the finalists. Yeah. You know, the trick is that conductors don't grow on trees, and they don't happen quickly. Um, so the trick is for any arts organization to find the people also, um, you know, hiring multiracial, uh, you know, casting like in opera or uh, in, in symphony as well. Um, sometimes you have to do your research. The people are out there, but they may not always have the spotlight that, um, you know, so, so you have to look sometimes. Yeah. You have to be... Yeah. Proactive, yes. Yeah, could you please say what's the differences, uh, or some, many of the differences between being an orchestra conductor and conducting opera, since oh, yeah. you do both? <laughs> I love both. I love the ability of the human voice to carry emotion. So I just came from Idaho um, <laughs> doing, we did Dead Man Walking there, um, which is quite a heavy 
subject material. It has to do with capital punishment. And um, so it's lovely to come here and do happy music. <laughs> I was like, yes, happy tonal music. Thank you. Um, uh, so much more to be in charge of with the opera. I mean, and then also so give many, up control. Yeah, there's so many things that can go wrong. Like um, <laughs> in an opera house, there are 86 professions all working in harmony together for that downbeat at eight o'clock on Saturday night or whatever. So, uh, and there's just so many things. Like in a symphony, it's a luxury because everyone's just sitting there looking at me. It's yeah. like, you know, in an opera pit, I mean, uh, sometimes the sight lines aren't, you know, you're far away, it's in the dark, there's like people moving around on stage, they're tripping over their costumes, the scenery doesn't happen right, somebody forgets their words, and there's just like, there's a lot to handle. So I think symphonic conducting, it feels like a luxury. Um, uh, honestly, the only thing is I wish, um, I actually wish that the audience would have something else to look at. I actually wish that because I like, I mean, when you're in an opera pit, you're sort of like the captain of a ship, but only the people on the ship know who the captain is, and that's fine. And everybody else is watching the drama on stage that's interesting. And so for a symphony concert, you might have to like close your eyes and imagine the drama or, you know, it's different. So, um, yeah. Yeah, some that's all. very inspiring visuals maybe has to have a place. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're pretty much running out of time. Thank you so much for these questions. I really want to thank these wonderful guest oh, artists. You're in for such a treat this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final comments? Any, any closing Something remarks? Something yeah. on my mind, which I yeah. I know I'm going to regret it if I don't do this. It's rude. It's not <laughs> polite. It's 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 completely inappropriate. So uh, that's, that's why I have to do it. Uh oh. <laughs> now I'm nervous. Because I, I mean, this is this is one of my favorite jokes, and to have two conductors here to tell us. Okay. <laughs> and, and not to mention right. we have a, a, a gentleman of the clergy here as well. Makes it absolutely perfect. It's, it's just yeah, but you two sure. conductors and a priest walk into a bar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, two right two there, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. No, but have you not heard the one? This is about the, the aging maestro, and, and he's been conducting this, this fine orchestra for 50, 60 years, I don't know, and he's revered and respected. At every concert, he climbs the podium, looks at the orchestra, reaches into his pocket, pulls out a small piece of paper, unfolds it carefully, looks at it, folds it back up, puts it in the pocket, and brilliance commences and the concerts are fabulous and the, you know inc incredible interpretations you know year after year after year decade after decade always the same the last gesture before starting the concert the unfolding and then came the inevitable in the middle of Beethoven's seventh symphony a clutching he fell dead the orchestra musicians ran to see if there's anything they could do. And one of them said, quick, look in his pocket. What's that paper? <laughs> Nobody knew what that said. And the first violinist reached inside and pulled the paper out. He carefully unfolded it. And there on the paper was a cross with the numbers. One, two, three, <laughs> four. <laughs> Well, I do want to mention that if you'd like to know more about Sarah's musical and personal journey, we have an event at 4 o'clock today at the Five Flags Theater on stage, hosted by our principal flutist, Tim Hagen, to, where she'll share a little bit more about her background and her life. And uh, as you can tell from today, it might be entertaining. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you to the Dubuque Symphony Arts for Thank you for a wonderful day.